This case is dreadfully tragic. A man brutally murdered his wife by hitting her repeatedly with a baseball bat. Then, two weeks later, he suffocated his two young stepsons. But his murdering streak did not end until four weeks later when he drowned his two little girls in a bathtub. Why did he do it? And why did he keep the bodies in the back of his van for weeks after he killed them? Before we start, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the loved ones of Casey Jones and her four children who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. Welcome to Summerfield, a small unincorporated community located in Marion County in Central Florida. Meet 32-year-old Casey Jones and her four children, 10-year-old Cameron Bowers, 5-year-old Preston Bowers, 2-year-old Mercalli Jones, and 1-year-old Ayana Jones. She was a very caring and thoughtful woman, the type of person who would give a complete stranger the shirt off her back. She loved caring for animals, especially dogs, as a veterinary technician and groomer up until back problems forced her to become a stay-at-home mom. But most of all, Casey was a devoted mother and wife who always put her family first. <laughs> especially her children. Her social media pages were filled with images and videos that portrayed a big, happy family. No one could have predicted what would come to pass during the fateful summer of 2019. During that summer, the children spent time with extended family, the little girls with Casey's mother, Nikki Jones, and the boys with their biological father, Richard Bowers, Casey's ex-husband. It was on August 1st when Nikki received an unexpected message from Casey asking if she could watch the girls, Markali and Ayana, for a few days. Nikki thought it was odd when Michael showed up to drop the girls off instead of Casey, but didn't think too much of it at the time. A few days later, Nikki received another message from Casey stating that she was sick and asked if Nikki could hold on to the girls for a little longer. She had the two girls for two weeks before Michael showed up to take the girls home. During the time that she had Markali and Ayana, Nikki received no messages from Casey other than asking her to watch the kids for a bit longer. This was unlike Casey, who would normally check up with the children quite frequently whenever they were in someone else's care. Still, nothing about the girls or Michael's behavior gave off any indication that something was wrong. More time went by, and the boys' birthdays passed without Nikki or her other two daughters, Sarah or Brandy Gilbert, receiving a single phone call or message from Casey, which was not like her at all. She usually made a big deal over the children's birthdays and always included her extended family in the celebrations. On September 14, 2019, Nikki, Sarah, and Brandy realized that weeks had passed since anyone had actually heard from or seen Casey. In addition, Casey had not been active on her social media. Panicking, Nikki first thought that it was Michael that must have killed Casey, but Brandy and Sarah thought their mother was overreacting. They believed in a more reasonable explanation that Michael was probably running from the law again, so Casey's family could be in hiding. Michael had been arrested multiple times in the past for burglary and grand theft. Back in 2015, Michael had gone into hiding after stealing money, a gun, and computer equipment from the Mount Dora Animal Hospital, where he and Casey worked as veterinary technicians. During that incident, Casey supported Michael financially when he fled to New Mexico to avoid being arrested, so no one in the family would have been surprised to hear that Michael was running from the law again. Still, Nikki was not convinced. Fearing for the safety of her daughter and grandchildren, she called the Marion County Sheriff's Office and asked for a well-being check on Casey. Deputy Chase King went by the Jones residence to check on the family, but the home was vacant and had recently been cleaned out by the landowner. 
King spoke with one of the Jones neighbors who said that he was asked by the property manager to accompany one of the maintenance employees over to the Jones house to investigate a strong and foul odor coming from the mobile home. The neighbors said that it smelled as if something had died in that house. Was there anything else out of the ordinary that you noticed? Just that plastic on the back. What plastic? It looked like it had plastic on the back of, of uh, where the window is. Okay. Like yeah. the windshield? Yeah, like yeah, like the back glass. It was replaced with plastic or there was just plastic over it? It looked like it had plastic right there. Like like plastic, plastic. Are you talking about like see-through plastic? Yeah, like but, a, not, but it wasn't see-through. It was, it was kind of like an opaque saran wrap? It was like, uh, it was a plastic but not see-through, see-through. Uh, my lieutenant's on his way. Um, I don't know if he, he may want to talk to you. He may just talk to me and see what information I've gotten from you. Is there any other information you might be able to give me that would be helpful? That's all I know. Okay. I, I do. went that way. Towards Sharps Ferry, and then he went towards Baseline, right? Toward Baseline. And you're positive you turned left on Sharps Ferry? Turned left. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, I do appreciate your time. Um, if you wouldn't mind just hanging out for a minute, my lieutenant's on his way That's here. So He's problem. somewhere on this road. He's just got to find a spot here, so... On top of the bad smell emitting from the home, King noticed a small red stain on one of the bedroom floors as he peeked through the windows. After discovering the red stain, King called Sergeant Micah Moore to come and help him investigate the house further. With the property manager's permission, King and Moore entered the home. The smell permeated throughout the home, and they recognized it as the smell of human or animal decomposition. King and Moore noticed one of the bedrooms had a new parquet floor and baseboards installed. When they questioned the property owner about the repairs, they were immediately told to leave. Without a search warrant, there wasn't anything more they could do. So King and Moore contacted two more investigators. They briefed them on the situation, and they promptly began searching for and contacting family members of both Casey and Michael. With no clues to trace Casey or Michael's whereabouts, the sheriff's office posted a missing and endangered advisory on the morning of September the 15th for Casey and the children and began working on getting a search warrant for their Summerfield home. During that time, the sheriff's office received a phone call from Casey's ex-husband, Richard Bowers, who had just discovered that the boys and Casey were missing. Bowers had picked up the boys from Michael on July 27th, it was always Casey who met up with him to drop off the boys, so Bowers was surprised to see Michael instead. Since he had recently fought with Casey over getting the boys for the summer, he chalked it up to Casey not wanting to see him and thought no more about it. Bowers kept the boys until August the 10th. Upon returning the children to Casey again, it was Michael who showed up. As Bowers was dropping off the boys, Michael took him by surprise by apologizing to him. Apparently, Casey had been telling Michael that Bowers was abusive towards her and the children when they were together. Michael had since realized that Casey was lying and felt a need to apologize for believing all of the things that she had told him. And I told him, and he remembered this saying, um, you know, a few years afterwards, because he even quoted it to me, and this was as, you know, I was b bringing them to Georgia, um, but before we left the mall parking lot, when I had picked them up for the first time, he had said, Richard, I just want to tell you, you told me something a few years ago that, re that rings in my ears, and I had told him, I said, you know, when we were in our altercation, I said, brother, I said, you, you, you freed me from 13 years of hell, yeah. and I said, thank you. And he reiterated that to me. He, he reminded me of that. He said, I want to tell you that I never forgot those words that you told me because I know now what you meant to this very day. And, you know, he just kind of gave me a brief history of, you know, everything that he's put her through, you know, about how if there's an 80 year old woman walking down the street, he's got a hold his head down because she would accuse him of, you know, trying to have sex with her or pretty much any female because that's what it was with me. Mm -hmm. um, but the part that was weird, sir, is he was really cool with me, you know, like, yeah. like he was my homeboy or something, you know, like we were best friends. And that's, I guess, it never dawned on me, you know, of course now it does, yeah. but it never dawned on me at that moment that, um, you know, like, 
it's almost like that was his apology for everything that he had done. And here I was, you know, I took it hook, line, and sinker, you know, because I'm a forgiving guy, you know, I want to try to see the best in people. Okay. And I ate it up, you know, I mean, we even hugged, you know, he shook my hand. Though this apology, along with Michael's sudden friendly behavior towards him, was shocking, like Casey's family, Bowers didn't pick up on any clues that Michael was giving him that might lead him to believe that something was wrong. Bowers didn't realize anything was amiss until he saw the missing and endangered advisory for Casey and the four children on Facebook. That was when he called the Marion County Sheriff's Office. Hours later, Detective Bartlett discovered Michael Jones was involved in a single vehicle crash in Georgia that same day. When police arrived on the scene, Michael immediately confessed to killing both Casey and the children. 41-year-old Michael Wayne Jones was arrested in Georgia in September of 2019 after a single car crash. According to arrest documents, a deputy noticed a bad odor coming from the car, and when he asked Jones about it, Jones said his wife Casey's body was inside the vehicle. Jones then took investigators to a wooded area where he had disposed of the children's bodies in totes and suitcases. Detectives say Jones told them he first killed his wife with a metal baseball bat. He then killed each child on different days and times by strangling or drowning them. Who is Michael Wayne Jones? We don't know all of the details of Michael's past. He was born in 1980 and grew up in Vermont. He lived with his mother and father until his father was sent to prison for reasons that were not disclosed. Eventually, his mother remarried, and Michael's stepfather turned out to be abusive. At some point during his childhood, Michael was the victim of sexual abuse, but we don't know by whom. Michael grew up struggling with depression. He was prescribed the antidepressant Wellbutrin, which is used to treat major depressive disorders. We don't know when he started taking the medication, but he was definitely taking it in the year he murdered his family. Though Michael had stayed in touch with his mother throughout his life, they were never able to establish a healthy relationship. For five years, Michael was in the United States Navy and also served with the Marines in the medical field. Not long after getting out of the military, Michael married his first wife, Sarah. The couple had three children together. For work reasons, the family decided to move to Central Florida around 2011. Sarah got a job working at the Mount Dora Animal Hospital in Orange County. Eventually, Sarah talked the owners into giving Michael a job at the clinic as well. Michael had a positive reputation at the vet clinic and was well-liked by the owners and staff. In 2014, Casey Jones, then having the last name Bowers, was hired to work as a veterinary technician. It wasn't long before Michael and Casey had an affair and both ended up getting divorced from their first spouses as a result. In 2015, Michael's true colors began to show. The owners of the vet clinic realized Michael was manipulative, deceptive, and had been making sexual advances towards female staff. After learning of all of this, the owners fired him. In retaliation, Michael snuck into the clinic and stole the items that we mentioned previously. Though Casey witnessed Michael's manipulative and deceptive personality, she stayed with him, and they were married on Halloween in 2017. Mercalli Jones was born the same year Michael and Casey married. Ayana was born the following year. Less than a year after Ayana was born, Michael would murder his wife and all four children. On July 10th, Michael and Casey got into a heated argument. According to Michael, Casey accused him of cheating and came at him with a baseball bat. She pushed him with the bat, and then Michael pulled it from her hands and began to strike her repeatedly until she died. Michael took her body and hid it in his bedroom. At some point, Michael made the decision to kill the boys, Cameron and Preston, after he got them back from their father. They returned home from their father's house on August the 10th. Between that day and August 22nd is when Michael murdered them. He targeted Cameron first, strangling him with his bare hands while holding him down with his knee against the boy's back. The following night, he went after Preston. Taking a zip tie, Michael tightened it around the young man's throat and waited for him to die. Michael would tell investigators that he chose to use a zip tie on Preston because his hands were sore from strangling Cameron the night before. 
On August the 28th, Michael decided to kill the two girls, his own children as well. Filling up the bathtub, he took the girls one by one and held them under the water until they drowned. Michael placed all of the bodies in bags and totes and used cat litter to clean up. At this time, Michael was facing eviction and was going to be forced to move out at the end of August. He had to find a place to go quickly. During Labor Day weekend, Michael phoned his ex-wife, Sarah. He said that he and Casey had split up and Casey took the children and went to her mother's house. To Michael's convenience, Sarah asked him to stay at her house in Jacksonville so that she didn't have to be alone during the upcoming Hurricane Dorian. Before heading to Jacksonville, Michael placed all of the bodies in the back of the van and then drove to Sarah's house. Michael stayed with Sarah until she received a phone call from the Marion County Sheriff's Office asking if she had seen Casey or Michael. Michael told her to tell the police that she had seen Casey and the children, and she obeyed. At that point, Michael realized it was time for him to leave and took off that afternoon and headed towards Georgia. So, obviously, you were staying with Sarah. Were you with her last night? Um, I was up there, yes. Up there at her place. Yeah, up up in Jacksonville. In the, is she staying in the apartment? Yeah, she okay. has an apartment. Did you guys hear my phone call and stuff last night? What was the deal with all that? Um, she woke me up early morning and asked me what was up with, you know, is there any reason why Marion County would be, you know, looking for you? And then I just tried to spin stuff, spin stuff, and finally I said, you know what, let me just get on the road so did you talk to did you tell her what in the heck was going on no she told us that uh when you talked to me or when she talked to me this morning you were still there is that true when when she spoke to you on the phone yeah i was there yeah. what was going on just trying to figure it out <laughs> you were trying to figure out what i had going on and yeah okay did she talk to you did did you tell her what to say to me, or? Uh, no, I, I, um, one point she thought it was looking for just me, and so I said, you know, if you've seen me or whatever, you've seen Casey, you've seen everybody, you know. So, yeah, I guess I did tell her. Okay, so basically, that, what was the deal with the McDonald's? McDonald's. She mentioned something about being at McDonald's. She met you at McDonald's on Friday or something to like, exchange the kids. Oh, uh, that's usually a meetup spot. Okay, so that's your usual meetup spot. Yeah. We're going halfway. Okay. So, after that phone call, how long after that phone call do you leave? Um, I don't think I left out of uh, Jacksonville until like three. Okay. Yeah. So you were there for a while. When after I called her the first time, I mean. Did you, did you ever tell her exactly what was going on, or you just kind of, I got to get out of here? Yeah, I just told her I got to get out of here. Did you get out of there after I called the second time? Um, around that time, yeah, we said she'd come back. She left the house and come back. And uh, we talked about, um, you know, she said, well, you know, why'd you have me tell them this? And, you know, they're calling me back. And I said, well, you know, let me, uh, let me try and go deal with it. So, and you called me, right? I did call you. Why did you come? What do you think was going to happen today after you left? What was the plan? Between September 1st and September 14th, Michael had all five bodies stashed in the back of his van while staying with Sarah, who was completely unaware. Once he entered the state of Georgia, Michael took the children's bodies and hid them in a wooded area near the highway, but for some reason he left Casey's body in the back of the van. Not long after getting back on the road, Michael ended up swerving off the road and crashed his van while checking his GPS. Michael received minor injuries from the crash and made the choice to call 911. When police arrived, he made no attempt to hide Casey's body. He immediately told police that he had murdered his wife and that he had her body in the back of the van. 
Michael also told police about the four children, what he had done, and where he hid the bodies. Michael was arrested and taken in for questioning. During the interrogation, police were surprised to find Michael calm, collected, and cooperative. Michael was first interrogated at a Georgia police station. During that interview, Michael stated that he had murdered Casey. He had pretended to be her by using her phone to send messages to family members. I had her phone for a while, and I, um, you know, I would, I would text and pretend to be Casey, and what's Casey's phone number? So then you're answering text messages back and forth, and yeah, so... He also created posts on Casey's social media accounts to give the impression that she was still alive. So you're, you're pretending this whole time to be Casey on, obviously on Facebook too, because you got some like collages that you made or something on Facebook and yeah. posted yeah. them. And... Michael told investigators he considered turning himself in before he had murdered his daughters. He sat parked in front of the city hall in Marion County, Florida for quite some time. By the city hall, looking down at the police department, which I believe was Marion County Police Department. Okay. Um, I sat there for several hours with uh, my daughters and turned myself in, you know. What stops you from turning yourself in? Just this basic fear that, you know, you're going to end up in the situation you're in right now? Yeah. But in the end, he chose to take the girls' lives and tried to run. Once the police in Georgia were done with Michael, he was returned to Marion County where he went through another interrogation. During this interrogation, investigators asked Michael if he had ever physically abused the children, which he denied. However, he mentioned that Cameron and Preston's biological father had. During our investigation, um, somebody mentioned some incidents that happened with the boys previously. Had there been any, like, issues where you discipline the children or anything like that and it got out of hand? Mm -hmm. How would you discipline the boys? Um, most of the time I would separate them and go to the room, but sometimes I'd spank them on the butt. Okay. Um, other than that, that was it. Would you ever spank them with anything besides your hand? No. Okay. Hell no. There was mention that um, the boys were disciplined. I don't know if it was a spanking or something. I know that when I was a, when I was a kid, I'd get spanked with a belt. Yeah. Did never. you ever spank the kids with a bell? No, or? I've, I've had that happen. No. Exactly. So, no. no switch from the tree, nothing uh, like that? No old school, none of that. It was just a hand. Somebody mentioned that maybe a clothes hanger? Nope. But that would have been something that happened when they were with their father. Tell me about that. Um, a couple of years ago, he was investigated. He had the kids for the weekend. It was Halloween, around Halloween. And uh, he... Uh, the, the boys came back um, in their costumes, and um, the oldest, Cameron, had a uh, Batman costume, like a one piece. And, you know, he's autistic and he has trouble, like, putting, you know, so it's like, hey, take this off. So I did it, and as soon as I did, he was going pee, you need to go pee. So I hollered at his mother, and he had bruises all over his lower back. And really? Was, yeah, real bad. Um, and it was investigated um, in Lake County. We lived in Eustis at the time. Um, and they did investigations and told her she was going to, you know, there was going to be an arrest made. It never happened. Um, you know, they kind of fell through the cracks. I'm not really sure exactly how, you know, what went on with it, other than um, that I guess he got an attorney and, um, you know, he said it might have happened on a bounce house or something like that. But Okay, so that was all kind of pushed to the side and yeah. went away. Yeah. Throughout the interrogation process, Michael was asked why he murdered his wife and the children, especially his own little girls, Mercalli and Ayana. He said his relationship with Casey gradually became more and more hostile. What's you guys' relationship like? I mean, is it is this an ongoing thing where you guys are at each other like this, like fighting or... Um, it just got worse, like, you know, little things all the time with her should come at me, and, uh, we, you know, we argue and, you know, never really got physical. Um, when Casey came at him with the bat and accused him of cheating, he just lost it 
After murdering Casey, why did he decide to go after the children? Why didn't he just leave them with family members? Empty prescription bottles and alcohol containers in the home show that Michael could have been under the influence of drugs, alcohol, or both when he murdered any one or all of his victims. But he never claimed to be under the influence of either during his interrogations. The trial began on December 8, 2022, at the Marion County Judicial Center. Michael was tried for second-degree murder in the death of Casey and first-degree premeditated homicide for the death of the four children. Since he had admitted to murdering his family, his trial went directly to the penalty phase. Michael may spend the rest of his life in prison or may face the death penalty. True evil poked its head up here in Marion County. That's about the only best way to describe it. It, as a father, as a parent, it breaks my heart. As a sheriff, it angers me to no end. Now, as far as I'm concerned, as the sheriff of this county, underneath the jail ain't good enough. He has no right to walk the face of this earth. I hate to be him when he stands before the Lord. I have never been a fan of the death penalty, but to be very honest with you, these are those cases where I, I would much rather that that happens than that he sits somewhere. On December 12th, the state attorney rested their case, stating that he wants Michael to receive the death penalty, and so do a few others. The state attorney explained to the jury how, in detail, Michael had brutally killed each and every member of his family without remorse. While the state attorney works hard to get Michael the death penalty, the defense attorney is fighting to keep Michael alive and have him spend the rest of his life in prison instead. The defense is scheduled to make their case in January of next year. He plans on calling 18 witnesses to the stand to prove that Michael deserves life and that his actions were the result of years of trauma he had suffered as a child and later the multiple relationships that he had as an adult with dominating and abusing women. The defense is referring to Michael's actions as a free fall of psychotic chaos brought on by a lifetime of abuse. The defense also believes the jury should take into consideration the fact that Michael willingly confessed to the murders of Casey and the children and even provided the location of the bodies instead of trying to cover it up on the day that he was involved in that accident. After all, it was Michael who had called 911 after the car accident, knowing he still had his wife's body in the back of his van with the strong smell of decay emanating from it. In Florida, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence says 37.9% of women and 29.3% of men experience domestic violence. According to the Florida Department of Children and Families, domestic violence cases were on the decline in 2018. However, the numbers began to rise again in 2019, the year Casey and her children were murdered. The lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic caused the amount of domestic violence cases to rise even more during the following year. In 2019, the department had 105,298 documented cases of domestic violence, ranging from what would be considered simple stalking to criminal homicide. In 2020, the numbers went up to 106,615, which was the highest number of cases since 2017. The NCADV says one in four women and one in nine men experience severe intimate partner physical violence. During his interrogation, Michael admitted that he murdered Casey after putting up with years of abuse from her. He couldn't take it anymore and lost it. But it's hard to know for sure if this is true, since he has a history of being deceptive and manipulative. Is he just trying to gain some sympathy? According to Casey's sister, Sarah, Casey and her siblings grew up in a violent and unstable household. All three girls were physically abused by their mother. Sarah says that their traumatic childhood led all three girls to grow up with the ability to become vindictive and aggressive, and she wouldn't be surprised if Casey was abusive towards Michael if provoked. During Michael's interrogation in Georgia, a detective mentioned that one of Michael's employees had complained about the numerous calls and messages Michael constantly received at work from Casey. He said that you were getting phone calls all day long and 
text messages all day long from Casey and oh that would be Phil probably yeah yeah I worked for him for a couple of years no uh, Eric okay so you that was Eric's new the new boss okay yeah. Casey's ex-husband, Richard Bowers, also said to Marion County investigators that she was physically and verbally abusive towards him during their 10-year marriage. I remember a time when we were back in Indiana, you know, I was, uh, it was only Cameron at the time, who was my oldest, he was on the couch, and I was on the phone with my mom, just talking to her, and, you know, she comes up behind me, rips out the phone cord, grabs a knife, chases me around the whole townhouse. I run upstairs. I mean, keeping granted, this is in the winter time, you know, up in northern Indiana, so it's cold. I had to open up a window, you know, please. I mean, I was screaming, you know, for my life. And, you know, the cops came. I remember one of the officers said, are you sure she's all right? I said, no, she's got, you know, yeah. some issues. But, um, I mean... How much do you want to know? I mean, I could tell you everything, you know. I mean. Though Casey was abusive towards him, the couple did not divorce until after the affair between Casey and Michael. Richard Bowers never claimed that Casey was abusive towards the children, and he did not try to take sole custody of them, but opted for joint custody instead. Bowers told investigators he did not like nor trust Michael and that his eldest son, Cameron, had once told him that Michael abused both the children and Casey. Bowers goes on to say that he was well aware that Casey and Michael had a history of long and violent arguments. Yet none of this information seemed to discourage him from leaving his children in Michael's care. With all of this supposed knowledge of the abuse in the Jones household, why didn't Richard Bowers do something to ensure the safety of his own children? Perhaps because he wasn't putting much effort into being in their lives in general. Casey had the children most of the time, and Bowers did not consistently make time for the boys. A text message argument between Bowers and Casey accuses Bowers of going an entire year without seeing his children. So I reached out to her originally June 5th at 5.50 p.m., what does that conversation entail? Um, yeah, I told her, you know, this is Richard. I'm reaching out to you regarding the boys. I'd like to know when they are out from when they are off from school, and when do they resume back again? And what a good time would be to plan for picking them up for the summer. Thanks. And she goes, they have been out and will be back in August, and we will be out of town most of July. And she says they have been out and will be back in August for uh, twice the same thing. And so then I answered, good. Well, I'll, I'll need them for about two weeks, so please be sure to accommodate your scheduling so we can set a proper time for pickup. She says, that's good. After a year, you finally want to see them. You can get them anytime you want before or after July. I have had plans that are paid for already that I can't change. And she says it's about July 3rd to the 23rd, and that was all on June 5th. And so then I responded back, um, this this isn't any new information you knew this time was coming which is why you and i sought an attorney anyway next time be mindful of the scheduling so you can plan accordingly and she goes i, w I will not work around when it's finally convenient for you to have something to do with the boys you have not contacted them in over a year so i've already made plans for the summer so as far as this time was coming no i had no idea because you haven't even called them for their birthday or christmas so the lawyer was your idea i have never kept them from you and the lawyer also said that you give me a 30-day notice and if i don't have plans then you get them you should have had plans months ago as i did so i plan around my work and around my college times off which is in july i won't be changing stuff it's already paid off which my lawyer already knows about for someone that walked out without even telling the boys anything you really tell me to be mindful that's not fair i'm sorry the boys are important to you but they are my life everything i do is for them it has been your loss on what you have missed out on this past year but i will not change anything in our life to fit your schedule you are the one that abandoned them you can have them anytime it's convenient for you as long as I don't have plans with them. I can't stop their life because you want to come in and out whenever it fits you. No one ever noticed any aggressive or abusive behavior from Michael. 
Michael's ex-wife, Sarah, never claimed Michael to be abusive towards her or their children. The only person to claim that Michael was abusive was Casey's ex-husband. Casey's family believed they were a happily married couple. Even though they did not particularly like Michael, he appeared to be a doting father and husband. And Casey's social media pages were always filled with happy family photos and videos. No one thought to look for signs of trouble. None were found until it was too late. No doubt, unaddressed domestic violence played a significant role in the tragic events that occurred in this case. Casey's family continue to struggle with the loss of their loved ones. It has been more than two years since they lost Casey and her four children, and they continue to wait and see how this horrific tragedy will transpire. In court, Casey's sisters, Sarah and Brandy, talked about how close Casey was with her family and how badly losing her and the children has affected them all. Both of Casey's parents died without seeing their daughter's murderer brought to justice. Sarah said their mother wanted to see Michael get the death penalty. Sarah, however, disagrees with the death penalty. She sees death as an easy out for Michael and wishes him to spend the rest of his life in a cell with nothing but time to think about what he had done. What will the jury decide? Will Michael have to pay for his crimes with his life, or will they choose to have him spend the rest of his life behind bars? If you or someone you know is a victim of domestic violence, no matter the severity, contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline. They are available 24-7 by phone or chat to discuss domestic violence situations and help create a personalized safety plan. Call 1-800-799-SAFE-7233 or visit thehotline.org or a similar organization in your country. Help is waiting. Say hi to the camera. Say hi. Hi, baby. He likes the, the sound of the water. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video. Comment down below your take on it and subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.